get started. Uh, the standard opening statement that will be at the beginning of every meeting. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 12th of January. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment in Northampton. Specifically, we are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our duties also include open space acquisition and management, but primarily focus on carrying out the provisions of the Wetlands Act and the Northampton Wetlands Ordinance. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates and times and agendas are posted in advance. We invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Uh, today's agenda includes a request for a continuation for a previously filed notice of intent on uh, uh, Smith College, uh, a uh, review of uh, the memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, Meadow City Conservation Coalition, request for a certificate of compliance by Susan Clopton and John Levine of uh, Florence Road, uh, a notice of intent for construction of athletic fields at uh, and a request for a determination of operability to determine whether an invasive species removal within the riverfront area of uh, Beaverbrook uh, is uh, subject to the Women's Protection Act or the Women's Ordinance, um, and then a variety of other uh, matters as well. Uh, I'll pass on uh, approval of minutes since we didn't get the minutes prior to uh, the meeting. So, uh, first item is uh, a continuation notice of intent for a dam and dike repair on the bank, land underwater, bordering land subject to flooding, and riverfront areas the Mill River, uh, the African Smith College facilities management on Paradise Road. Uh, the applicant requests a continuation with no discussion until January 26th uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, can we get a motion? Move to continue to the 26th at 5 p.m. on this room. Second. Second. Any second, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So voted. Uh, second item, review of the memorandum of understanding with the Mother City Conservation Coalition. Uh, before um, I begin this segment, uh, let me say that uh, this, a, a couple of things that may be helpful um, in clarifying what this discussion is and isn't about. Um, it's pretty normal that the uh, city, when it has responsibility for uh, public lands, for agriculture or open space, um, will partner with uh, citizens groups um, who volunteer to take over some of the city's responsibilities. Um, uh, if you uh, call Sarah, um, uh, what, what you hear on her line is that she's got three jobs and she answers the phone for all three jobs. So it's only a portion of her time that has anything to do with uh, open space management and the conservation commission. And we don't have any other uh, paid staff and all of us are, are volunteers. Um, so it, it, we rely on citizens um, to participate um, in that way. Um, it happens all over town. We have farmers that uh, lease land on city-owned property, um, have done that uh, for a number of years. Um, and so it's something that's quite normal. Uh, when Sarah uh, uh, let me know that uh, a group had come forward wanting to take on some responsibility for a piece of land in the meadows, sounds great, happens uh, all the time, pretty normal, good for them. I'm uh, glad to, to see somebody stepping up. Um, and we figured we'll take a look at the memorandum of understanding and consider the language and um, in all likelihood there would be no uh, meaningful discussion to, to be had, the kind of thing that's uh, quite normal. Um, and then we found out that in fact there is a discussion to be had. Uh, but I want people to understand that A, this is not transferring control. Um, the uh, control of the land remains with uh, the Conservation Commission. Um, it's uh, a fairly narrow um, definition of what another group would have responsibility for, uh, in the same way that we've uh, granted a lease to a farmer, and the farmer has to do certain things within certain constraints. Anybody that we have a relationship with would also be subject to the same constraints. So this is not transferring um, control. It's uh, transferring the uh, uh, certain limited uh, responsibilities for a defined period of time. 
Um, and uh, uh, secondly, as I said, it's a um, no, no, it seemed like a, a, a good, even noble thing, but perhaps no good deed goes unpunished, and, and in fact, it's going to create some kind of controversy. Um, this was not expected uh, that it was, in fact, in any way controversial. Um, so, uh, with that as an opening to kind of clarify what uh, the discussion is about, um, uh, we'll open for public comment. Um, uh, we'll, we'll try, we, we, we've allotted a half an hour because we have other, we're primarily a, uh, primarily a permitting body. We, we grant uh, or deny uh, permits uh, for uh, a variety of activities in and near resource areas as defined by the Weapons Protection Act and City Weapons Ordinance. And that's our primary responsibility and we have some of that work that we have to get to. So we, we've defined a half an hour uh, for this segment of the meeting and, and we hope that uh, that would be enough. Um, Wayne, can you say some background at some point before sure. we start the conference? I, I was going to ask that. Okay. Um, um, so I just want to go over a few things, sort of how we got here and, and what the city's policy has been. And, and I'll go through this very quickly. But just going, going back to 1987, there was a neighborhood group um, that was formed to fight a project at Cook's Pastor. Um, that group became Broadbrook Coalition. And we're used to, we've always had sort of individual projects people oppose and, and fight the project. Broadbrook said, we want to be different from other neighborhood groups who just fight a project. Instead of just being opposed to things, we want to be in favor of it. Mm -hmm. And so they had sort of a set of goals. And, and one of their things is they came to the Conservation Commission in 1988 um, and said, we want to be a management partner for Fitzgerald Lake. Conscom would still control the property, just, just as Kevin was saying, but we'd be doing a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance, a lot of the day-to-day -day work. And so Conscom signed a memorandum agreement with Broadbrook Coalition and that became sort of the new gold standard. We're always looking for partners ever since. So since then, Broadbrook's still the most formal one, but we have agreements with Lead Civic Association for Roberts uh, Hill and for a couple of smaller conservation areas, for Friends of Selma Hills, Friends of Mineral Hills. Um, and so that's sort of been, uh, uh, so that, that's been a consistent goal for you guys going forward. So that's sort of the first point. We've always, that's always been the preference. For example, when we acquired the property from the Blymans on Potash Road two years ago. The first thing is to look for a management partner for it. We initially had discussions with Grow Food in Hampton. We had hoped they'd be a management partner. They became overwhelmed because suddenly this other project came forward. Um, and so they sort of weren't really able to do it. But, and then we ended up signing a license with a farmer. But the preference was to do it with a nonprofit. Um, so that's sort of the first point. The second point is there are two mechanisms by which we work with somebody else. Um, when we're working with a nonprofit group or a neighborhood group, we do this memorandum of agreement. And in essence, we're working with them. It's not a legally binding contract. You can end it anytime you want, but it says, this is great. We love the fact you're doing free work for us. Um, and that's absolutely our goal. And neighborhood empowerment is a major piece of that, to, to let the, the, decisions not, the decisions be as local as possible. When we work with a private farmer, it's a different process. We sign a license. It's a non-exclusive agreement. By law, it's a maximum of three years unless we go to city council. Um, and so usually it's a maximum of three years. The license, the end of the license term, it's very clear the, the person holding the license has absolutely no rights whatsoever. In fact, it's illegal for us to give them any rights beyond that term. So no expectation any time someone has a license that we renew it. Obviously, for the same reason you grant a license one time, you may grant it to them again. But there's no expectations, and that's clearly in the license we're doing. Um, the third point is, in the open, we just threw, and threw a lot of public hearings, a lot of public hearings last year. We might had, in our open space plan, we had four public hearings and something like 14 public meetings. Um, the, the plan was ultimately approved by eight different city boards. Um, and one of the plans spelled out clearly is there are, in essence, three categories for open space, the Conservation Commission is interested. One is those sort of near wilderness areas that we're managing primarily for wildlife. We have a long-term goal of that being 25% of the city. The second is working landscapes, farms, orchards, those kinds of things. Um, and the third is areas which primarily serve as being neighborhood recreation uses. So that is, we want our urban areas to be attractive so people don't have to flee out to the suburbs and rape and pillage the land and convert the land. So, so keeping urban areas attractive is really important. 
Montview from day one has always been managed as one of those neighboring areas. So originally this is a small farm, it was on the market, Dora Lewis and Jim Nash, I think I saw Jim here before, um, were interested in buying the farmhouse and initially the owner was going to sell them the farmhouse and sell a bunch of homes, uh, or a bunch of building lots. And Dora and Jim approached the seller and said, wouldn't it be great for this to be a conservation area? And in essence, between a combination of them probably paying a little more for the land because they're surrounded by open space, some tax benefits, and a relatively simple deal, the, the land was purchased by the city. But from that first day, it was purchased to serve neighborhood goals. So in fact, if you look at the city council resolution, which Sarah pulled out, it talks about the goals of the property. Um, and it says, well, maybe we're going to put a, um, a community garden on the site. Um, but then we went to the neighborhood afterwards, because this was primarily about serving neighborhood use, and they very much didn't want community gardens. And so the whole discussion in the neighborhood at the time was how much land we're going to allow, let fallow, so everything on the left side of the property, which was farmland, we allowed to be fallow, so it would become wetlands, and we want to restore it. Um, some of the land is going to be farmed, um, and some of the land is going to become a soccer field. So all those decisions were made with the neighborhood. They, we, Originally did the work with a federal grants, and the neighborhood did the fundraising to match the federal grants in the city. So the reason for the background is this is not a wilderness conservation area. It's not a working landscape. It's primarily about neighbor use. To the extent farming meets the neighborhood, that's great. But we do optimize. You know, it's very different than the farmland we have at Elwell, which is optimized for farm purposes. This is optimized for neighborhood purposes, and farming is second. And so that comes back to this. You know. Seven years ago, when we first signed a license, there was no neighborhood group involved. In fact, the goal originally was to put a conservation restriction on the property, and we couldn't find a neighborhood group who'd take it. So we ended up not being able to put a seal on the property. When this new organization was formed, then it suddenly became a new opportunity. And so that's why we've gone down this route. Thank you. Any questions by the commissioners for Wayne? Um, I'd like to invite members of the public uh, to make comments. Uh, can we first get a, a, a sense of uh, how many people uh, want to speak so we have some sense about how much time we should allocate? Yeah, it's a, do, do you know each other in a way you could somehow allow? Because I, I, I hate to try and squeeze this as, you know, like a city council, you have two minutes, if, if it takes more than that. On the other hand, we have other work we have to do this evening. And, and if, if there's a way to limit the um, number of minutes and still get the important messages out, perhaps that's. Uh, let me ask you first, since I don't know whether you know each other or, or not, or have come with some kind of pre-discussion. Hmm, okay, well let's, uh, Owen? My suggestion is that you would expand your allotted time from 30 minutes to something slightly longer. It'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll have to be slightly longer. Um, for the applicant that's uh, uh, coming back, we can't just blow them off, so we have to respect them. So. And one other recommendation is if, uh, if you've heard someone speak to your point already, don't reiterate a point. That would probably complement some of the conversation. Good, thank you. So, uh, when, when you have uh, something to say, please raise your hand and then spell your last name so that we can record it. Sure. I'm Alex Jarrett, that's J A R R E T T. Uh, I live at 8 High Street in Florence. I'm a member of the Paddle People Cooperative. And um, I helped to start the Montview Neighborhood Farm uh, six years ago, but I'm no longer involved in it. Um, I'm not opposed to the Meadow City. Conservation Coalition managing the land, but I have concerns about the makeup of the coalition. Um, I see this city conservation, it's city conservation land, and the coalition that oversees Montview should represent the interests of all the city. Right now, it's primarily made up of, of others who, in, as I understand it, the, um, the actual subcommittee that makes decisions. Um, so I'm asking that the commission delay the decision, uh, schedule a public hearing, and um, require that the Meadow City Coalition allow voting members outside of the neighborhood to allow for input um, other than 
just in the neighborhood. And to remove the requirement of paying $15 in order to vote, um, as this discourages participation. Thanks. Um, uh, let me ask a, a clarifying question of Wayne, since uh, this practice of having identifying the purpose of the land acquisition, in this, in this case, for neighborhood benefit, um, as opposed, yes, it's owned by the city, but it, uh, how has that kind of issue, if it, if it has been addressed, how has that been talked about in the past? That, to what extent is it citywide governance of the property? Yeah. I mean, it is because of the Conservation Commission's ultimate responsibility, but on a day-to-day -day basis, how? You know, consistently, in terms of that sort of neighborhood empowerment, you've tried to defer to neighborhoods as much as possible while reserving the right to mediate for a broader issue. So, for example, Broad Brook Coalition has done a wonderful job. There was a conflict once between equestrian users and trail users. And so, even though we have a member in agreement with them, that came before the Conservation Commission, mm -hmm. and you were asked to weigh in, and you found a good compromise that way for it. So, so usually it's sort of deference, and the assumption is given the neighborhood's meeting, it gets to make some decisions, and if something has to rise, you know, again, the MOA does not give up your rights. You have the right to cancel any time. So if there's an issue, it can come before you can make a decision elsewhere. So it's by that reversion to the responsibility of the Conservation Commission that um, the, uh, potential conflict between the preferences of the immediate neighborhood and the uh, preferences of others in the community would be immediate. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, Jane Potter, I'm the president of the Meadow City uh, Conservation Coalition. I'd just like to, to your point, um, we had an open meeting the other night in which we invited both people who were there and, um, for that matter, people who were not there to be an open election for the standing committee of neighbors. Just, I just wanted that to you know. <clears throat> Yes. Claudia Lesko, 40 Valley Street, L-E-S-K-O. We're a butters, so we live. Our property extends along Monview Avenue, right across from the wetland area, which is on one side of the farmhouse. And just to add to Wayne's, uh, you know, history, before this uh, Dora and Jim came to buy the property, the house was owned uh, for many, many years by the Quadro family. And when we moved there 32 years ago, there were three elderly Quadro sisters, and the Quadros owned the property. Quadros is a very large construction firm in the city who've done projects like um, JFK and various other things in the city. So the sisters were very elderly, and when they either died or left the property, and the property went up for sale, we were very concerned about what would happen because it's downtown property and it could be easily developed into condominiums. One of the farmers on Henry Street had his property up for sale specifically so he could, you know, retire on the income from this. It was very prime property. And somehow Wayne and the neighborhood got together and said, we're very concerned about this and there was some kind of agreement that whatever would happen in the property would come first to the neighborhood, that there would not be upscale condominiums there if it didn't meet somehow the regulations of the city, but also if the neighborhood was against it. So starting very, very early when Grace and Anna Quadro left the property, the neighborhood were sort of shepherding this property and keeping track of it. So sure enough, first a developer came and he bought the property and the price went way up and they tried to put some high-end condos on it, and we it was turned away, nobody was really buying it. Then another developer came along and bought it from him, and again the price went up on this property, and again they wanted to put high-end where Town Farm is. They were talking about a very high-end development there, and again the neighborhood, and I am talking about the abutters and people who live right there because no one else really knew what was happening with this property, although maybe that's not true. Various people came to buy it. So I'm just saying that it's a very interesting issue about control. You know, when you're talking in the South during the civil rights and they're saying, leave us alone, you know, we want to have segregation, everybody says, no, we're not leaving you alone, this is against the law. You know, when you're intervening in a foreign country like Iraq and saying, we know what's best for you, like people are very uncomfortable for 
about it. It's not a straightforward issue. I feel like the people who have, are complaining about the abutters and wanting to make it a broader issue are not taking into consideration the impact that this, this piece of property has had forever on the people who live just there. Um, my name is Ben Kalish of K-A-L-I-F-H. I live on Four Long Ave here in Northampton. And I would like to know if there is a precise um, definition of neighborhood that is being used in these discussions. That term has come up many, many times tonight, and I do not know personally exactly what that means in this context. My sense is that uh, there is no official citywide definition of the term. Itself. Yeah, I mean, sort of, you know, I mean, I certainly I can tell you that most people, there's a magic number of 10 minutes of how far people typically walk. And so, you know, if you're asking me, it's immediate butters and people in 10 minutes walk, but that's, you know, there's nothing beyond it. There's no official definition. I'm, I'm moving from this side to this side, so we're going to go over here. Sir? Hi, Jim Nash, NASH, 18 Montview. Um, you know, I welcome public discussion around the use of this property. Always have, have always encouraged. Uh, when Montview first uh, uh, came to the neighborhood, uh, uh, proposed a, uh, a, a the formation of a board that included uh, neighbors, included farmers, and uh, shareholders. Uh, that um, that I'm really disturbed by the level of politicizing that has occurred around this lovely piece of property and the and the the changing of the um, the the tenor that both the neighbors and the farmers have gotten along until you know the snow has come that um, currently the Montview neighborhood farms their their shed sits on the corner of my property because they are not allowed to have it on the the conservation property they've stored tools in my shed, they've used my water, I've worked with them on projects, I've mowed the field relentlessly, um, that, and that here we are, and the tension in the room is, is it's actually, it's very sad. And that, um, that even, you know, that, um, and again, I'm going to invite people, uh, many of the people who are complaining about what, are, what is going on are, actually within that catchment of neighbor. Um, uh, Lisa, one of the, the, I don't see her here tonight, um, one of the uh, uh, main, one of the three main partners uh, is within eyeshot of the field. Uh, her, uh, the other, uh, Molly, who was another uh, key constituent, um, used to live in the neighborhood as well. I, I, I'm going to continue to do this, and I'm going to invite the people who are neighbors to please come into the discussion with us. Um, we are open, I'm open to having, you know, the, I think there's a distinction between leaser and neighbor. And, and from my perspective, the two are getting mixed up. That, that there's a leasing con contingent in the room that's getting mixed up with um, how, do we, how do we make the decision process. I don't think the decision should go to leasers. I think it, it, sh it and I think you know, it's worked well by having the, the neighborhood being the primary focus of that decision process. I think it needs to be good for the entire city, but I, I would really like to see the, the energy change around this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir. Um, Jesus Leva. Um, I live at 37C Holyoke Street. Um, not really, really close to the farm, but reasonably close. Um, I actually had always thought that it was really great that this land existed. So I guess at the very least, I, I'd, I'd like to say um, thank you for the neighbors for you know going through that and putting it together, and um, for being, for having the exchange with Montview and creating that opportunity. Um, because it, it, it was the first time in my life that I got to go to a place and actually farm as someone who had, was 
born in New York and lived in the city most of their life and have no experience in anomaly farming whatsoever. Um, I do want to say that in terms of inviting people to the process, I was specifically told by Sigrid at one point earlier in the process of um, the neighbors organizing on this idea that as someone who would be a potential applicant, that I should not be included in the discussion. Um, Carol, who's not here tonight, who um, is my girlfriend, was also told the same thing. I believe Paige was as well. Um, at, at a certain point, yeah. At, at, at a certain point. And my feeling uh, from that point on has been that the neighbors had decided that they wanted to have a certain amount of control over the land, and I was okay with that. I mean, that I think it's reasonable for the neighbors to insist on what they want to do with it. The reason why I'm actually here is because there are so many other process issues that came up as a result of, I think, the, the Conservation Commission, I guess, wanting to have the neighbors have direct control over it that has very, I, I think you're right, has very little to do with the neighbors or the land or any of that. And I think that, I think that that needs to be resolved. But I also want to say that the history of this land, at least the very, the most recent six year history of the land is unique when compared to the other lands that you've been talking about. And I think that until the matter is really resolved and people have had the time to discuss this and really talk about this and understand it, that the city should continue to steward the land, that the city should continue to maintain, uh, to manage the land. And if the land is going to be managed by a different group, that there should absolutely be a public hearing about it. Comment by one of the commissioners. Yeah, I just want to make a comment Please. that when you speak, speak to the commission, not to your neighbors or friends or whatever, um, because quite frankly, we're the ones in charge of the, of the property. We like the comments that come through the board and get away from individual discussions. Mm -hmm. Like you raised your hand and we were going to talk to the guy. Um, no, I wasn't going to talk to him. Yeah. I was going to talk to you. When you're when you're called upon, yeah. Yes. Not in the middle of a discussion. Just address your comments to us, uh, not to each other. Thanks. Good clarification. Yes. Adele Franks, I'm here on behalf of Grow Food Northampton to urge the commission to slow down this process of making a change in management of the Montview Conservation Land. I do think that it is possible to come to a very amicable situation between the neighbors and the city, the uh, re residents of the, of the city. And this, it doesn't have to be so fraught with anxiety, and if it gets slowed down, I think we can get there. I think in light of the fact that this land has been farmed for the last six years by a very well-respected and regionally renowned group of permaculture proponents who have educated the public and engaged the community, that to make a change suddenly, to put out an RFP that a private group is going to ch select farmers, perhaps new farmers or old farmers we don't know, um, ar arouses anxiety and a lot of concern about the process. And at the moment, the process on the website for the uh, Meadow City Coalition uh, does not give the appearance of being transparent or fair or credible. Now, it may very well be that that's what you have in mind, but it is definitely not explicit on, on the website, and it appears to have a very rapid time course. The applications are due on February 15th. The decision is supposed to be made by March 1st, based on um, a, 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 the decision-making body appears to be a group of neighbors who don't necessarily have any specified or required expertise in farming or agriculture. And speaking from my experience in growth in Northampton, where we just went through quite an extensive process of selecting a farmer for, for the land that we own, we found it invaluable, it crucial to have advice from uh, successful organic farmers uh, in order to help us reach a wise decision. You couldn't possibly have done it without them. So we are very concerned that there doesn't appear to be a requirement in either the MOU or on the, on the, the MC3 website 
that this process um, have that sort of outside expertise to join in with the community, the local community, the broader community, to shepherd the land. And we would like to see you slow down a little bit and uh, make sure that the process is in fact um, transparent and professional and fair. Thank you. Hi, my name is Libby Reinish. That's R-E-I-N-I-S-H. I know that we have limited time, so I think it might actually be helpful to um, for the commissioners if I could get a show of hands of people who are in the room to ask for a slowdown or for the city to continue to manage the land. Is that okay for me to, to do? Because I don't think everyone's going to get a chance to make a comment, and I'd just like to... I think it's okay to do. I'm not sure what it tells us. Um, All right. It, it, it tells us how many people in the room. Uh, not, it doesn't tell us what's right, and it doesn't tell us what's out there. It just tells us what's in the room. Well, let's I, just I let's just very quickly just take the temperature of who's who's in the room. So who's here because they have concerns about this process? Well, I think we all do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, many. Okay. So, so I live on Isabella Street, which is right around the corner from Montview. It's very nearby. Um, and I am here to ask the Conservation Commission to continue to manage the land without uh, going through an MOU with a third party. And also, if the Commission does wish to sign an MOU with a third party, I ask that you hold a public hearing before you do so, and that you solicit multiple proposals from organizations that might be interested in such an agreement. Um, the Montview Conservation Area is really unique in the city of Northampton. There are few, if any, parcels of city-owned land being put to so many uses in such an urban setting, and with so much community involvement. I think you, know, you have mentioned that in your introduction, Wayne. The small-scale farming project and permaculture-based food forests and the educational workshops have developed the community at large's interest in the land and has also provided a place for people who don't have access to farmland to grow and harvest food. To my knowledge, this is the only place in the city where volunteers are farming collaboratively on public land. And this land has been become truly special and if property stu properly stewarded, I believe it can continue to nourish the community both nutritionally and educationally into the future. And I believe that these unique uses of the land make it different from other public land that's being managed by private entities. And as such, I believe the city's informal policy of forming these public-private partnerships must be re-examined in, in the case of Montview. Um, most of the concerns I've heard stem from the need for neighborhood input over the use of the land. And I feel that there must be neighborhood input, of course, but I think there's a difference between input and oversight. And this MOU gives M3C too much oversight over public land, even though the city will continue to own the land, and even though it will continue to have final decision-making power. If neighborhood input is a concern, I suggest that the city write requirements into the license to farm, mandating that the farmer form a publicly elected community advisory board, and have in place a written grievance policy. Uh, in an email sent to the Grove Food Northampton listserv last night, Wayne Fiden wrote, quote, the MOA approach is part of the Conservation Commission's two-decade-old approach of signing MOA designed to empower neighborhoods. I don't believe that we have properly defined either neighborhood or empowerment in this case. Is the neighborhood composed of abutters? Is it people living in a small geographic area designated by M3C? Is it Ward 3? Uh, as a self-identified neighbor, I would not feel empowered but disenfranchised by the decision to transfer this power to a private entity who are not elected or appointed by the community. Uh, and what does the city's MOA approach empower neighborhoods to do exactly? Ultimately, this is public land and everyone who lives in Northampton should be empowered to have a say. <coughs> Unfortunately, the M3C subcommittee does not represent the entire neighborhood. I, I value all of the work that the neighborhood has put into the land over the years, but you know, the, the face of the neighborhood is changing. You know? Right now, you know, this group does not represent the, the neighborhood well, I don't feel. Um, let alone the community, and the MOA and M3C's current policies are not sufficient to guarantee proper representation of the neighborhood or the community at large. In fact, M3C's policies appear to do somewhat the opposite because they do have geographic restrictions on who can participate and they have due requirement for dues. Um, 
I also think it's notable that there are no protections in the MOA or the current version of the RFP for the fruit trees and perennial plantings on the land. Uh, these plantings have become an important community resource and they should be protected. Um, whatever the Conservation Commission's ultimate decision, I believe it's clear that the draft MOA requires further consideration to ensure protection of the land, the public's access to the land, and public participation. Uh, thank you. Sure. My name is Mac Everett. I live at 40 Valley Street, and I'm a, both a member of the board of the MCCC and also, uh, as I said, an abutter who lives across the street. And I'd like to speak a little bit about the, the process that has led up to the situation that we're in now. And that, because I'm not sure everyone in the room is totally aware of it, but the, the people that have had the license, the Montview Neighborhood Farm, have farmed the land in two three-year segments. And the second segment ended December 31st. And last summer, people in the neighborhood began to meet to talk about what was going to happen because of the three people that were involved, one person told us flat out, I'm not interested in farming anymore. Another person said, Lisa said, uh, I don't know what my plans are, uh, my plans are up in the air. Paige has always said she's going to would like to continue on and we have the greatest respect for her commitment to the land. But that response left us thinking, well, what's going to happen? And as people have already said, this is this is a piece of land that's in a densely packed downtown neighborhood with people living all around it. So we feel a great stake in what happens there because we need to live with it. And, um, you know, you heard a description a few minutes ago about the Montview Neighborhood Farm. And as an abutter who's watched it all these years, I'm going to say that was accurate for four to four and a half years of the six years that that license was held. And there's been a lot of concern in the neighborhood about the past year or so about things deteriorating, basically. It, it is not the farm that it was the first few years when there was a great deal of neighborhood involvement and a lot of volunteering going on. And quite frankly, the three principals were getting along with each other much better than they were towards the end. So as the neighbors, we're thinking well, there's a lot of uncertainty here. The process is going to come to a head when the because the, the lease is up, so what would we like to see here? Well, we would like to see a fair and open process where any farmer or farmers who would like to present a proposal to use this land can do so, and that we, as neighbors and abutters, can have, uh, we, we've, well, the city has invited us to help create an RFP that would reflect the kinds of things that we would like to see there. We're very grateful that the city has encouraged that. Um, and that we would like to see that process go forward. And the people who, apparently, there's, there may have been, I'm not aware of it, but there may have been a change in heart by the folks that have had the past license. Perhaps they <coughs> want to reapply. Great, they have the right to reapply along with other people. We would just hope that the process would be open so that other people who have other plans that might or might not be better suited to the land would have an opportunity to, to do that. My other thing I wanted to say is, as a, as a board member of MC3, Oh, oh, the other, the last piece about that, the, about what I just said was, I feel like we had several very public meetings. We made an effort to bring in as many people that we could find that were possibly interested in the future of the land. We created a large email list so that we could have, um, you know, inform people as to the conversation and keep as many people involved as possible. So I feel like a lot of effort was made to be open and transparent about the process. It's true that we, as abutters, have a special interest. And that's been true ever since the get-go. Um, because, as I said, we live there, and we are especially uh, aware of the changes in the condition of the land. Um, as an MC3 board member, I feel like, uh, again, I'm appreciative to the city that we have been asked to, to play a role. in uh, The city has is land rich and resource poor. We, we know that it's very hard for the city to be able to do everything that needs to be done to, to um, oversee the, what is it, 20% of our land now is in conservation. So we, we have appreciated the approach that the city has taken in terms of trying to, to work with other citizen groups to steward different pieces of land around the city. 
we as MC, MC3 started last year, we're an organization of right now 39 members. Um, we have done a lot of outreach. We've organized several community educational events to try to get the message out there that we're interested in starting this new organization <coughs> in Ward 3. And again, I feel like, you know, some of we've been characterized as kind of the evil empire a little bit here. And I, I just don't think that's appropriate. I think we've tried really hard to be inclusive. And uh, I, I would hope that some of the folks here that are uh, expressing objections to the process would come. We would love to have them be involved. Thank you. Anybody else? This gentleman back. Uh, <clears throat> Peter Blanchett. Um, uh, I just want to speak to the commission about um, the process of uh, some of the problems that occurred during the... Um, I, don't, I don't have actual count of how many meetings we have, but I know from looking at my calendar we had at least 11 two-hour-plus meetings, which I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but that's what we had. I've never done anything like this, but to me it seemed like a lot of time. And one of the re the, the, one, the, the, the sole reason that we asked those folks who had to do with the current lease not to be uh, in, with, in meetings after a certain point was that they had been in all of the meetings uh, and as up to up my count, um, uh, out of 11 meetings, eight, first eight. And when we started to discuss um, just any notion of, um, you know, things being different than they were there, um, there, would, there, there would understandably be a dynamic uh, of defense, you know, because uh, some, all, I think all of us have different orientations to different aspects of the experience of having the leaseholders there. I'm, I'm uh, across the street. I held, I hosted the um, um, vegetable distribution, you know, the little farm stand where the, C, the CSA uh, on on my lawn, um, and they and they kept their, you know, put the stuff in my shed to get it out of the rain. So uh, it started there. But when we wanted to discuss as neighbors, and when we looked at, frankly, the paucity of guidance that we had from the city of how to do this, how to do this, um, one at one point we we agreed, all of us. That's why we asked Paige at one point to um, not be at the meetings for a while. Uh, uh, is that we 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 thought we could be. Uh, you know, held accountable for some sort of insider inclusion in the crafting of our RFP. So there was a certain, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't aspect to how we went forward with this. And I just wanted for the record that to be said that um, it cannot be said truthfully that we excluded anybody who worked or at, uh, at that, in that lease there, we actually included them for the majority of the meetings and in fact asked uh, many questions of them for guidance uh, and you know we, uh, Paige uh, happily attended and we had many discussions that were really helpful from her and um, as it was stated before some of the other leaseholders said that they weren't interested in going forward with it and this was a confusing issue to deal with so I do admit that at a certain point we felt we needed a little insulation from those dynamics in order to get one thing that was in the in the written documents we had was that the neighborhood, and I agree, the neighborhood needs to be defined, and good luck defining that. Um, but it needs to be, you know, uh, because the neighborhood can be defined by some people, anyone who's on a list serve, okay? Anyone who's on a list serve might be our neighborhood, you know, our global neighborhood. So it needs to be defined. And, uh, you know, that, that was a part of what happened with the process. Just like to speak to that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm Paige Bridgens, B R I D G E N S. I'm one of the leaseholders and uh, look forward very much to continuing uh, Montview Neighborhood Farm in this next lease cycle. Um, first off, I want to thank the city for working with Jim and Dora for making this land into conservation land. And I want to thank the neighbors for that amazing relationship that we had for so long. And I know I shouldn't look at them because I'm, I'm really addressing you, but I hope they're listening. Because for 
five and a half years, we had just a splendid relationship. And I want to reiterate the generosity that um, Jim mentioned. We have a shed. You know, it, it, for the first bunch of years, we kept our tools under a tarp. And then we approached Jim and Dora. They said, yes, you can build a shed and put it right on the corner. And I want to acknowledge that, yes, we had our farm stand in the blazing sun on Montview Avenue. And Maddie and Peter said, come on over to this side. Come right under our shade tree. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful relationship. And I don't want the future to be defined by some conflict. And I still, I haven't put my finger completely on what the conflict is. Conflict that has taken place in a short period of that lease. I would like for us to figure out together what that conflict is and to work on it. We had a good thing going. And, and I'm not ready to give up on this neighborhood. And so on to the issue of um, my being asked to leave the steering committee. The steering committee led up to the creation of MCCC. Um, I felt fine about that. Um, I felt a little weird about it because I thought, wow, we've had such great meetings. And um, my experience is pretty different from Peter's in that um, I don't remember being defensive. I'm, I remember getting really excited about new models because we were trying to figure out how to proceed. And Dora at one meeting said, well, what about a co-op? How about we morph the farm into a co-op? And there was excitement all around, and we invited Alex to come and talk with us about how a co-op works. And we looked at different models. I was very interested in looking at different models. Believe me, I was interested because I wanted to continue into the future. What else do I want to say? Um, I want to continue the lease. Yes, we have um, done a lot of perennial plantings. I understand that there's an RFP process. Should the next leaseholder not be us, or not be me and some other configuration of people, I'm certainly hoping that the neighborhood, or I guess I should say the MCCC subcommittee, would choose someone who would honor the work of these perennial plantings and who would take some excitement in um, the ecological design of community food production that does not disturb the soil structure, that um, is one-time plantings, and then you've got this yield over years that can feed this neighborhood. Another thing I want to, another historic point I want to make, um, I believe it was Peter mentioned that things began to fall apart, or Mac. Um, town Farm came to town, and we helped with the neighborhood to bring them. We met with those developers and said, you've got a lawsuit coming your way if you try to develop three condos and a two-acre lawn on that property. And really pushed to get that to remain agricultural. We said, if, in, if instead you take on this couple, this farming couple who live right here in the neighborhood, we will fully, fully support you. Well, that and the fact that Town Farm had assets really made it possible for Town Farm to come. So during their first year of CSA, we had our little farm stand over under Maddie and Peter's honey locust tree, and people would drive by on their way to Town Farm to get their shares, and, and you know, it placed the neighborhood in a loyalty bind. I mean, they were going to be getting more vegetables and, I don't know, probably a better deal at Town Farm, and yet some people just said, nope, we're sticking with you. You are with us. And we just had a, we had a good relationship. <coughs> but it became untenable for us to continue under those circumstances. It was a lot of work um, to provide the produce. Meanwhile, Town Farm had sheds going up and goats and and sheep at that time, and um, 
it was pretty hard to compete. So we needed to morph into a different model. We had to kind of figure out what was next. So we morphed into a model of, of, of a mosaic of, of um, micro-eco-enterprises. And, um, you know, until that time, the design of the forest garden, and I wrote a grant, got $1,500 for the forest garden, by the way. Um, the design of the forest garden was that that would begin to feed into the CSA. You know, just as those Asian pears would come on, those currants, all that produce, that would just get folded right into the CSA shares. Then the CSA folded. And um, so I thought, well, Let's see what else is out there. You know, maybe as the produce comes on, neighbors could buy shares. Maybe what's left over, cereals would take. So I went to talk to Gary over at cereals. He said, sure. One last thing I really need to say. So I was asked to uh, not be on the steering committee. I said, fine. Um, most recently, uh, Monday night, um, another person who is submitting a proposal um, was voted to be on the subcommittee of NCCC and to be um, in a position to help draft the RFP that he'll be applying for. Thank you for listening. Any last comments to address something that hasn't already been said? Yes. Very brief. My name is Marcy Clark, C L A R K, at uh, 84 William Street, and I just want to express our concern both as the steering committee, I was, have been a member of the steering committee which was the grassroots informal ad hoc community committee. I am now a board member of the MCCC and I'm also a part of the standing committee, the, the subcommittee. And our concern is just, I, I see that there are a couple of different questions being posed and requests. One is uh, challenging the MOU altogether, one is challenging the timing of the MOU and and I would just submit that we are very concerned about and sensitive to timing for um, potential farmers. Two last comments. Gentleman in front. Great. Uh, my name is Eli Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. Um, and uh, I want to read a quick excerpt from um, Lisa DiPiano, one of the current license holders. Um, the, the second half of, of a message she, she sends is, um, we're really fortunate to live in a community that is rich in local agriculture, but more and more it's important for people to not just be able to buy local food, but learn the skills necessary to produce their own food in sustainable ways, and that's what Mount View focuses on. We support local farmers having access to land. We think that's really important. And we think that more and more, it's important for people to have the skills necessary to produce food. We also think it's important for neighbors to have a say in this process. We want their voices to be heard, but it's also important to have other voices at the table, because this is a community asset that is important to many stakeholders. This is an important decision. We urge the Conservation Commission to create an inclusive process in which diverse stakeholders can be heard. Um, so that's from Lisa. And, and for myself, um, I just want to quickly say that, that I, I just moved to Northampton last week as part of this um, Sustainable Agriculture Fellowship. Um, so, so I have funding to work for a year with Montby Neighborhood Farm. Um, and I was attracted there because of, of their use of agroecological principles, um, their forest garden and annual vegetables and education program. Um, and I also have copies of, of letters of, of support for Montview's educational work and kind of demonstration work um, from John Gerber, a professor at UMass Amherst, and from uh, Ben Grosskopf at the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Um, so to me, it sounds like the situation you're describing where, where um, while neighbors have legitimate concerns and, and their concerns would be prioritized, there are also more stakeholders in the decision about the land. Uh, Bill White and um, uh, City Councilor at large. I've got to get used to saying that. Uh, and also, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, Jim Nash and Dora Lewis are my aliens. Just so. Um, and and so, consequently, I'm actually familiar with some of the history, the backstory as well. But actually, the problem that you're facing right now, as far as city problems go, is a damn good one to have. You have well, up until recently, you had standing room only in this room of people all vested in the prospects of this property and all vested in that, not for massive development, not for encroachment, not for pillaging or anything else, it's actually for the enhancement of 
a tiny, tiny piece of land that actually represents a great deal to a lot of people. And so as those problems go, that's the starting point. And I, and I think um, to the point that there's room to negotiate. And so what I would encourage you to consider tonight is actually, and I, and I understand that time is critical here, but I think what's more critical is to, I, I think there's plenty of room here to negotiate and create a reasonable solution that will satisfy everyone. But I would defer, I would recommend that you defer uh, a decision tonight, and, in, and I'm sure everyone here can pretty much get together pretty quickly and start to figure out what's the best way to, to navigate this. And unfortunately, because the way we, we all know how this works, those of us, those, particularly those of you sitting at a table and those of us who have served in public office, that in the absence of communication contact, what's filled is what, what generates a suspicion, intrigue, and bad feelings. Yeah, you know, Northampton's all about group hugs, and I think that what we can do is work on starting from the premise of understanding with the same interests and the same objective. And I honestly think that you're nine-tenths of the way there. So it, I think that whole process gets scuttled by the fact that if the MOU is, is decided on tonight. So, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, counselors, what are your thoughts? What are our options? I agree. I think we are uh, prefer and uh, meeting with all the parties. It just makes sense. Other than Russians and this and I, and I realize it's time sensitive. Uh, better make decisions before the growing season is upon us. Uh, but I think there's enough time to sell. Yeah, we have to hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very soft-spoken. But I, I'm agreeing that I think we should have another meeting with all you folks in the commission and perhaps come to a solution rather than have half of Northampton angry and wanting to shoot our porch lights um, rather than have everybody you know, get together and, and come to an agreement. Waiting the deed transferring the property to the city, the purpose clause, did it specifically mention the motion to do it? Do I We can't hear you. Yeah, close to the speak up so we can hear you. But they forgot to put in the microphones when they renovated this room. I'll say it again. I was asking whether or not there was specific language in the deed transferring the property addressing the concerns of the neighborhood, the neighbors. Some deeds of transfer specifically set out conditions, especially when a group is involved intimately in creating the transfer. And it's sort of part of the price that the city pays for all of the work that's been done. In this case, I'm just trying to determine whether there's a legal basis for the claims of the neighborhood, or whether this is a policy discussion, because obviously that will guide my view. Um, I just want to clarify, though, that in dealing with any of the organizations that, that assist the Conservation Commission in managing property, if any citizen is unhappy with what's happening in that process, they, they do come directly to us. The most recent example that I can think of is hunting on city property was brought, you know, a number of hunters were concerned with the rules that were being enforced and promulgated by Barbara Coalition. And they came to us and we had extensive discussion. So again, I think, you know, just to second what Wayne said at the very beginning, the control is never truly ceded by the Conservation Commission because we are the group that's responsible to all the citizens. And, but at the same time, um, it, having, you know, we do have an embarrassment of riches here in terms of the number of people fighting to, or contending to make this work as best it can for the city of Northampton. And you can all sign um, my pad because I have a bunch of other things. I have a bunch of other things to maintain. Um, Barrett Street Beaver Diversion <laughs> needs to be cleaned out. So um, I, I would say that we should defer this given um, the 
temperature in the room and consider all the views. I'd like to find out more information about um, the MCCC, uh, about its organizational uh, bylaws, about its membership rules, uh, so that, you know, and about its history uh, so that we can make the best decision for all the people in the room and the citizens of the city. I agree. We should defer. Toward uh, what intermediate step? Um, it, it, uh, Mason is suggesting uh, a, another open meeting, conservation commission meeting, with uh, a published invitation to all interested parties to come and see if uh, in that venue we can come to some uh, kind of agreeable conclusion. Um, the, there, there could be other uh, options of proposing that, uh, that those in the community, in the neighborhood, take that initiative uh, so that it's not required to be uh, a, a conservation commission scheduling, uh, which, which will add some constraints. How many of us do we have to have a quorum, et cetera, et cetera. Can, can I follow up on that? Because I was trying to say this before, probably not very well, but. There's really two totally different paths you take. So uh, the MOA route, the MOU route, you know, with a, with a nonprofit, um, not required to be a nonprofit, but it's always been our preference when we yeah. can do it. Um, Friends of Soma Hills hasn't incorporated, so it's not you've always done that route. Right? Um, and there, in essence, what you're doing is giving them the day-to-day -day responsibility for maintaining the property. And so then you can you can negotiate that, and you could have them work with farmers and others to come back to the proposal. If you end up licensing this to a private farmer, then in some ways you're much more constrained. We have to figure out, this is one of the headaches we'd rather not do, exactly what's the financial value for that. And we can't charge less than the financial value for doing it. So we're more constrained if we do that. Now, we've been creative in the license, but it worries me we've been a little bit too creative about saying they're going to give that value in donated labor. Um, and that's the arrangement with Elwell, is it? That no, this has been the arrangement here. Uh -huh. We had a great time with Wayne and uh, Bruce. We cleaned up a parcel of land that was later sold to the Fish and Wildlife. Many tires and pesticide tanks removed from the woods. Yeah, yeah. It was really fun. Yeah, it certainly wasn't a lock of being once for the work. I worked on those uh, beaver deceivers. Yeah, 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 was it with you and uh, Paul? Or? Yeah, it was staff, two commissioners, and one member of the public. That's right. Here I was. So, so there's more flexibility for an MOA than there's a license. Generally, though, even for a license, you have enormous flexibility. The value is below twenty-five thousand dollars, and it's pretty clear the value is below twenty-five thousand dollars. Can I just ask a clarifying question about that? It's something that I, I've been wondering about since you said this. Um, if Montview Neighborhood Farm, for example, which has been the license holder, but the license is signed by three individuals, if Montview Neighborhood Farm were incorporated as a nonprofit. Would that process change, and would you advocate for an MOU as opposed to a license to farm with that group? You know, it, would they be kind of become the kind of organization that you would maybe do an MOU with? The the being incorporated as a nonprofit certainly makes it a lot easier. I think it's still that that neighborhood empowerment piece. So if it would, if they were just farming, and ultimately getting some of value for farming, it doesn't make a difference. If the structure is different, and it somehow include the neighborhood, however defined. That I think that's the difference. There's not an agricultural restriction on this land. So that's it's, correct. It, 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 it's not uh, constrained to only be used for agriculture. Yes, I understand that. The, the one thing we can't do, I, I keep carefully using the word license as opposed to lease. We can't do an exclusive arrangement. So you can't do a lease where the farmer can prohibit the public. That you can't do. Right. You can't do anything over that three year period. I guess we count so you have five years. So. You know, you all can say you'd love to have trees and you'd love to allow someone to do it, but you can't give, you can't guarantee that the trees are going to remain in the future. So this is going to take some risk to do it. So if the sense of the commission is that indeed we do not act tonight, but defer this, then the question is what's the uh, most uh, useful and expedient uh, basis on which to, uh, to proceed? We, uh, it seems that, I, mean, I, I um, Similar to uh, what Councillor Dwight pointed out, that um, they, my, my sense was that it was, it was pretty uh, invigorating to have a, a large group of people that um, are active enough and caring enough to actually show up um, after work in an evening. And 
we often toil to empty walls in this room, um, and it's nice to have uh, uh, occasion to have people say, hey, this is important enough that we care about this. Um, I also think that um, Northampton is, uh, in, uh, been here for going on 40 years, and, and that, it, that it's a kind of uh, place that is, um, people expect to have a, a voice um, and to be taken seriously. Um, what I think we want to be a little careful of, that that sort of sometimes implies to us if we don't feel like we've had enough voice that somebody else in a back room has figured something out. I think what's clear from this discussion today is no, no well-intentioned people have been doing their level best to try and make um, uh, good-hearted, responsible, well-intentioned decisions. And sometimes, you know, it's not so clear to everybody that in fact that's what's going on and so you're a little suspicious. But I, I think this is a very Northampton kind of um, experience that we're in, in the middle of right here. And that, that's a good thing. Um, that, 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 that's what's kept me and my family here. Um, so, uh, I, I guess the question is, if we're going to um, uh, have more to more information, a, a proposal. Usually what we do is not make decisions, we entertain proposals and consider options and then render a judgment. So I, I, I'm trying to figure out how can we get collectively um, people to come with, to us with proposals and hopefully a, a consensual proposal so that we're not picking winners. Um, we're um, uh, evaluating the merits of, uh, of, of some options. Kevin, do you mean proposals for farming, or do you mean proposals for how to proceed? No, for, for, it's, it's, it's oh, a proposal okay. for, for structure, because yeah. it, that's the, 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 the issue. I mean, as, as Wayne says, the, the, the ground rules that this um, is both city-owned and um, uh, prioritized for neighborhood benefit, those, those are givens. That, that's what we have to, to work with. Um, there is no official definition of neighborhood. There's no official definition of how to balance citywide and local, um, either a butter or, or larger uh, neighborhood priorities. So we have to make some judgment. Um, and Can I have we a usually of information in the decision, about the RFP. Have we talked about because we what will happen to the RF? Maybe people will like the RFP that's been developed. Well, that, that it, which it is quite possible that um, those who have been working um, as uh, part of the, the uh, coalition, um, and those who have not yet been part, if they got in the same room, would say, hell yeah, actually this is a process that can work pretty well to address everybody's concerns. I don't know that. Um, it seems like there's some steps that haven't happened yet. I'm just wanting to make sure that we don't have our requirements for open loop meeting law postings uh, uh, scheduled to get a quorum <coughs> of conservation commission members together slow your process down so that it can only happen on a, you know, we meet twice a month um, and it, I'm, I'm trying to make sure we don't um, put obstacles in the way of this progressing so. to that end I may have stepped in it but <laughs> Um, given the fact that I think the ne a negotiation probably take play, uh, be more effective in a neutral forum, um, I'm well. I'm reluctant, but I'm offering myself up as as a, a mediator, and could, we could convene a group of all the all the stakeholders or hopeful stakeholders. And that be, Bill? Excuse me? Who would that be? Would that would be the, every, you, I would, I, well, I would Who say Claudia, and actually, it, in keeping with the, the formalities of the, of the thing, we, we, you and I should talk about that outside, right. and inside, as opposed to inside, but I think, well, I, I'm making this up as I go along, so I don't really have, I haven't come up with a plan, but I think that the, uh, you know, there are clearly a lot of people here interested, and there may be more people interested to come. Or so, less, who knows so that. So presumably that would, be, would involve some kind of public invitation. It would be a public invitation, however, it would not necessarily constitute, it wouldn't require a public notice, it wouldn't have all that, right. it's not so much a deliberative body, it's a, it's a negotiated body. And, and there, whatever comes out of that is hopefully a solution. I don't mandate anything, I won't decree anything, I don't, there will be hopefully a report that can be presented to you that 
might allow or might facilitate your decision. Uh, it may be an abject failure. But the fact is, is that, that, you know, I mean, this is supposedly what we signed on to do when we, when we asked people to vote for us. So. Oh, and the other elected officials. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll. <laughs> My name is Owen Freeman Daniels, Woodmont Road. I'm the Ward 3 Councilor. Um, most people in this room are my constituents, and uh, I want to say that I do think that there's been a lot of work that the neighbors, that is the people who came to the meeting, I was one of them, the, the nearly dozen meetings have put in. I think that the Conservation Commission uh, would do well by retaining some authority, uh, and I know that it is, but it doesn't appear that way because the RFP after a long, a lot of negotiation, quite frankly, uh, is on the verge of being constructed and written. Ready. If I might offer a suggestion, it would be that the Conservation Commission retains the right to approve, or at least to review, the RFP before it's submitted, or before it's circulated, rather. Again, uh, I don't want to uh, negate or to take away from the countless hours that the neighbors and when I say neighbors, I mean the people who came to the meetings. Sometimes they were from all over the ward or all over the city. Sometimes they were just the ones around the corner. They did a lot of work on this. And um, maybe the MC3 is the perfect solution. Maybe it's not. But the RFP, I think, is really something that uh, um, they've worked on. And I think that the Conservation Commission can allay a lot of fears and anxiety by reviewing it. I also think that that will add a layer of public review, which uh, may be salubrious to this process. Um, perhaps that's a, um, an option then, uh, because I, I, uh, we haven't seen the, uh, the RFP. Um, it is, uh, seems that the, the devil is indeed in the details, that people's concerns really derive from um, not only a, a, a process, but a result. What, what's actually likely to happen, and what are the defining parameters of, of the request that's going to steer toward uh, that outcome? Uh, so per, uh, perhaps uh, it makes sense if there is uh, a meeting, whether under the auspices of uh, the, the Neighborhood Association or with uh, uh, Councilor Dwight's uh, offer to facilitate a meeting or chair a meeting, um, that at our next meeting, which is just then two weeks away, um, we could, if, if something could happen in between them, where there could be some source of, of uh, exchange, and that we at that point are uh, hearing um, from those of you who are concerned citizens, all concerned about the same topic, um, in either that there is a single recommendation or a couple of options, and that would include our opportunity to, uh, having heard all of this, I think we now have uh, more information with which to consider um, whether a specific RFP um, is indeed, quote unquote, in the interests of uh, not only the narrow uh, uh, technical areas that we have responsibility for, in terms of wetlands acts and so forth, um, but also what we understand since we have management responsibility for this property on behalf of the city, uh, based on what we've heard from you as members of the community, does the RFP seem like it steers toward that kind of desired outcome? Um, so my sense is to, uh, to propose, and I'll see if my colleagues on the commission agree, um, that we encourage you to in some way get together, uh, whether it's a neighborhood association or Councilor Dwight uh, calling the meeting, um, and uh, discuss whatever you need to at that point, so that two weeks from now um, you come back realize I'm out of state, so I won't be here in two weeks, but a quorum will be here in two weeks um, uh, to hear um, whether there's a single recommendation, um, whether in fact there, there may be more than one option to be uh, considered by the uh, commission, and at that time that the commission, or in between now, could also have reviewed the RFP, uh, which might be modified as a result of your process. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, could review the RFP to see if it looks like it's in alignment with the concerns that we now are aware of. Um, 
that should affect our thinking about the management of the project. Does that sound like reasonable? Uh, my contact information, I, I'll give you, I actually, it's easier to go to the Northampton City website and my email's there, my phone number's there as well, so you don't have to try and memorize it. Can we say. have comments about the proposal before we settle on it, or not? No, at this point, we've heard the input from the, uh, the, the community Except uh, that the members. complaint was that there wasn't enough publicity, and so somehow I think the alternative would be to give it to you, post it, Put it in the paper so that nobody can if, say if to if us, we is, didn't out. If that is part of the, 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 the process, and certainly we've got to see the RFP at some point. Um, and we've got to hear from, um, uh, this is a, a concerned group of citizens. And we're trying to hear from the concerned group of citizens. Is there That's a why proposal it that rest can be, with you. It ultimately does. Um, we're, uh, up until, uh, day or so ago, we were blithely going along thinking we were doing the right thing by doing what we usually do. Um, now that we have heard the disparate input, um, we're hopeful to come to uh, use that input to come to a conclusion. We could just say, we'll, we'll pick a winner. And that doesn't quite seem like the right course to go. I think it's better to say, hey, if you folks can get together, um, discuss some of what's been brought up here today. See if you can come to enlightenment. If not, come back in two weeks. Not doesn't delay things for too long, but delays things some. Um, uh, that allows us to then consider a proposal or a couple of proposals, and by that time we will have reviewed the uh, the RFP as well, which, as I say, might get modified through the process. So, um, and I'm going to keep the, the, the hearing closed at this point. I, 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 uh, uh, we do have uh, other work that we have to accomplish tonight for applicants who um, uh, can't go forward with their projects until we rule. Um, and so, uh, it, what do my colleagues on the commission think of that, that suggestion? That there be a further community discussion coming back in two weeks with a uh, uh, proposal, or if you say, hey, we're still at odds, we can't come to anything, then we'll know that too. Uh, but at least at that point, we'll have heard everybody's input. We will have given you an opportunity to talk further, and we will review the RFP and see if it looks to us, and it's ultimately our call, whether it steers down the path that we think on the basis of what we win is the right path. That's uh, in line with my deferment request. Yeah. I've moved to continue this discussion on the 26th at. <laughs> at 6 p.m. in this room. 6 p.m. in this room. Maiden seconded? Second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.